Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Break free from the forces holding you back. Get the life you deserve. Eliminate stress, reduce anxiety, decrease depression, and start living your full potential. Thousands have used Dr. Fujian Zane's Awareness Integration Theory, an evidence-based behavioral health breakthrough with incredible life-changing results. Getting rid of past trauma, having fulfilling relationships, increasing earnings, and living their best life. Now, the Fujian app is available to everyone. The app is Dr. Fujian Zane's Awareness Integration Theory in the palm of your hand. Download the Fujian app today. Do you wish to wake up one day and hit the Life Reset button? Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zain. Helps you navigate crucial life areas, heal the past traumas, and cultivate fulfilling relationships and careers. Life Reset is your guide to a profound journey to reshape your life. Grab your copy on Amazon or Audible now and embark on a path to a more joyous and fulfilled life. Welcome to the Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Fujian Zain, a psychotherapist and author and the creator of the Awareness Integration Therapy. I am so thrilled to have you join us today. And I promise you, we have a very, very insightful discussion. I learned a lot today from our guests, our wonderful guests. I chat with Dr. Sabrina Strings. She's a professor at North Hall Chair of Black Studies in the University of California in Santa Barbara. Her book, Featuring the Black Body, The Racial Origin of Fat Phobia, won the 2020 Body and Embodiment Best Publication Award given, to, given by the American Sociological Association and um, was honorable and mentioned in 2020 Sociology of Sex and Gender Distinguished Book Award given by the American Sociological Association. Today, we will talk about her latest book, which is called The End of Love, Racism, Sexism, and the Death of Romance. Um, we talked about what is romance? Uh, what is the situationship? How has it changed? Uh, what was the history of it? And what was the history as we look at um, Black America and the rest of the world? Um, how um, the power of women has been used and the power of uh, women has been abused or has been dismissed and how um, the women have across the world in some form or another uh, been, you know, the, the <laughs> I call it a toy. Um, to to be used however they want. I it also ends with a beautiful uh, conversation and a beautiful um, message about who we are as love and you know how we can uh, choose the way that we want to be in relationships and courtships and all of that. Um, so I hope that you learn as much as I learned. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. Now, be sure to subscribe to my podcast, my YouTube channel, and connect with me through my website, fujanzain.com, or any of my social media platform. Um, go to Fujan app. You will have 31 areas of, of uh, your life and then videos that could support you. You could go through journaling and guided journaling and really, really become not only aware of who you are, your strength and your greatness, but also clean up the past, the things that are holding you back and um, supports you into envisioning an amazing future that is up to you and you're creating and co-creating it with the world around you. Uh, we found that it has about 60% up to 60 and sometimes in some areas higher 65% of improvement in the areas of life where um, people who have used the Fujian app have uh, created in their own life. So I really hope that you also enjoy it and uh, create what you need out of it to make the best out of any area of your life that you want. Share your thoughts with me. I love to hear from you. So um, I wait for you to call me, um, email me, um, go to my social media and message me. Um, I love to hear from you. Now, without further ado, here's Dr. Sabrina Strix. Intentional Parenting, a practical guide to awareness integration theory, written by Dr. Jafari, Dr. Fujan Zain, and Dr. Manukian, three experts in human development, 
is your step-by-step -step guide to raising a healthy child prepared for a culturally integrated world. You're supported in parenting infants to adolescents using the latest evidence-based scientific research on parenting. Order your copy on Amazon now. Eliminate stress, reduce anxiety, and decrease depression. Dr. Fujian Zane's awareness integration theory has helped thousands like you get incredible life-changing results. The Fujian app gives you her evidence-based treatment in the palm of your hand. Download today. It is so nice to have you on our show, Dr. Sabrina Strings. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, I really enjoyed going through your book. Um, I learned a lot because um, you bring a, a different uh, perspective to what I've known about romantic love and not only in my own experience, but also, um, you know, working 32 years, 33 years with couples. And uh, it was uh, it was very eye opening. So everyone, we're going to be talking about uh, Dr. String's latest book. The End of Love, Racism, Sexism, and the Death of Romance. And uh, what I also liked about the book is the way you wrote it. Not only you brought personal experience, you brought humor into it, you brought history into it, you brought sociology into it. And um, and I think that it, you know, it closes and it ends in um in a very positive note. So I just wanted to share that. That's how I was experiencing it. What brought you to want to write about this? Well, thank you so much for your kind words about the work. And um, I think like so many other women, I decided to start writing about this as a form of self-help. It was my own form of therapy. I have been through so many bad relationships. And like many other women, part of the way in which I was able to process these was to have conversations with my friends about them. And then after one conversation with a friend in which she said to me, are you okay? I started to realize that my trauma was not a joke. And I also came to the realization that I'm far from alone. Uh, women everywhere are going through something similar. So I decided simply to start chronicling my experience. And after doing that, I was encouraged to look into the history of these relationships since, again, there are many women going through it. Yes. So let's open this up from different angles. Um, you talk about um, situationship. So situationship and then the, the, the discrepancy of it versus romance. Can you, from your world and the way you were describing it, share with us what do you mean by situationship and what do you mean by romance? A situationship is um, entanglement between two people who are having some type of sexual affair, but the contours of it are completely undefined, meaning that they don't know if they're just friends with benefits or if they're at the beginning of a relationship or if they're simply hooking up and have no other relationship to one another besides that. So that's why it's called a situationship. You're in a, a sexual situation, but you don't know uh, where it's going, if anywhere. It's probably going to simply continue its stasis. Right. That's different from a romantic partnership. A romantic partnership relies on there being usually a cisgender man and a cisgender woman following a script that was constructed largely in the mid ages in Western Europe, in which men are supposed to be valorous and strong and proud and rescuing women. And women are supposed to be beautiful and polite and quiet and waiting for a man to save them, right? And this also includes many other romantic rituals like buying women flowers, taking women out and paying for the date, you know, women cooking for men. All of these are part of what we now consider romantic relationships. One of the things that was interesting that I, I was, as I was uh, going over your book, is that um, in my head, in my world, in my uh, culture, uh, there was always a difference between the courtship and the romance. You know, a lot of times the courtships was exactly what you were talking about and it was about marriages. A lot of times, even traditional marriages were family bound, right? Like I come from, um, originally I'm from Iran. 
So when you look at the Middle East, where you're looking at all of those, um, India, you're looking at a lot of the marriages are courtship exactly the way you're saying. And what I've also noticed is like women, as they become around like 18, 19, 20, we, we, we kind of have the Cinderella syndrome, right? Like <laughs> we're all ready for the prince to come and choose us. And then, you know, do all of those pieces. And like, they, they're they ready, right? They, they're finding how to find that courtship and move forward. Um, and then romance was always in the books as if um, some, you know, it was just a heart to heart suddenly falling in together. And half at a time, you know, a lot of like you see the Indian movies or there are different classes and they can't get together or, you know, in some of the romance mo- novels, uh, romance was something extra, which had nothing to do with the courtship. Now, the 20th century and 21st century brought this concept of, oh, maybe these two should be together. And, you know, now we want love. We want our courtship and marriages to also have romantic uh, love in them. But I was as I was reading your uh, book, it was more about uh, you. you I saw that romance and courtship were kind of intertwined together in, in the way that you had written it. Yes, absolutely. So when we think about courtship, at least in the Western world, it it always involves those kinds of elements of romance in which a man is showing that he's brave and he's strong. You know, I was thinking about even um, Johnny Knoxville show and also Tom Green's show. Like, you know, so these were shows like Jackass, for example, um, in which there are these men and they're doing the most outrageous, ridiculous, foolish stunts. And you're like, what? is this? And then recently I was thinking, oh, these are men proving that they are tough and strong. And like, they're trying to show like a nineties or aughts type of uh, Lancelot play, right? So when we think about what men are supposed to be doing, they're supposed to be doing something that is eye opening and brave and surprising. And also something that women either can't or shouldn't do. That's part of how a man in a, the Western world is supposed to prove his affection for a woman and also prove his masculinity, right? So those two things are intimately tied. Yes. Um, I was taking this course um, at the Harvard and it was uh, about evolutionary psychology. And part of what I also understood was that from an evolutionary concept, you know, animals play a game uh, in for courtship, right? They have their own way of stunts for courtship in how to capture the other uh, gender in order to, you know, have an offspring. And exactly what you're sharing, that the men, you know, the male, um, the human male has to have that strength and have to have the ability to go hunt and take care. And then the, the women had to be able to um, you know, bear uh, the, the fetus in a way and uh, had to ch- choose the men in particular in the way that they were acting. And that ultimately human beings are not monogamous, that they are pretty much uh, polygamous in, in many different, at least even if, if they are trying to be monogamous, it's appearing to be um, kind of a serial monogamy and the ratio of people kind of coming into that romantic courtship and live a lifetime, the percentage is getting less and less. And I think this is what you're sharing in your book, which is, can we get out, get off the fantasy here and really look at what reality looks like? I like the fact that you brought it back to fantasy because what we've been talking about and dancing around is the origin of romance. Romance began in the 12th century in Western Europe, in France. And part of the reason why it was developed is that there was a queen, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was mother of Richard the Lionheart. I'm sure many of you who've ever seen a Disney film have heard of this character, who was a real person who lived. However, his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, worked with a poet by the name of Christian de Troyes to create this fantasy that we now call romance. And so in this fantasy, we have Lancelot, again, an entirely fictional character who's supposed to be one of the knights of the round table with King Arthur. And so at a certain point, King Arthur's queen, Guinevere, is captured. Lancelot is in love with her. So he volunteers to rescue her and he's successful. But critically, they don't end up together. 
It's important for, I think, people in the audience to understand that we think today that romance and courtship and marriage, of course, naturally go together. But that was not true at the beginning of these romantic tales. They were all about love and loss. They were about infidelity for 600 years. It was only with the Enlightenment that the idea of romance became attached to marriage. But as you've already pointed out, humans are a polygamous species. And so it was always a fraught concept. Yes. And even if you put them in a structure where the society or the religions put them and stuck them into a society that had to follow these rituals, you would see a lot of the extramarital relationships that would be happening all over the place, whether they were only sexual or whether they were emotional affairs that were happening. It still showed that, you know, humanity has this as uh, as a fact and uh, we need to look at it from another different way but you also i mean your book is partly about the love and the romance uh, but it's also about racism and sexism um and you open a door uh, to really look at for me that was very new looking because i it, uh, it, it was bringing new knowledge for me as wow I never thought of it that way. I just thought of it as sexism, mm. right? I always looked at it as men, women, men were attempting to utilize women as objects. Mm -hmm. And obviously in a lot of also male dominant um, um, countries such as Middle East and Eastern world, you always shared that, which is, but of course men do this and women are being used as, objects and uh property you know and that was just and then they could have the uh, they could do whatever they want because it was their property to do and the laws are still saying that they're their property and then as you brought the concept of black american into it and you know women black women into it um and it was very interesting because in my view my own personal experience i've always um my friends, colleagues, clients that I work with, women, African women, American African women, Black women have always, to me, were strong. Like this amazing strength of a woman was coming, you know, for, for me, that was the concept. And I was reading your book and it was giving me a whole different idea about the stigma that you were sharing in this book that came to me and I'm like, I've never seen it that way. And it's amazing how, again, as I said, you were opening my eyes. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, unfortunately, as these romances were being written, um, so way back in the 12th century, there was an observer by the name of Andreas Capianus, and he was detailing precisely what goes into these romances. And he was noticing that in point of fact, not everyone is eligible for a romance. Romance was known as a courtly love, which is why we call it courtship now, because it was very much about the aristocrats, the nobles. It was about the elites. And so what he was describing is that this is an, this is an opportunity for a man who today we might be you know, considering middle class, but at the time would have been a knight. So of that station, looking upward you know, at the nobility, he's sort of social climbing. We might even say gold digging today, right? Like he's looking for a woman of a higher status to be in love with. But if it's a woman of his own status, he doesn't have to try very hard. And if it's a woman of a lower status, well, you just take her by force, which is a euphemism for sexual assault. And so when we think about how black people ended up in the Americas, we were obviously taken from our homeland and enslaved here. That already put us in a position of being in the peasant or slave class that was never supposed to be eligible for a romance in the first place. One of the things that I like to point out is that romance, as it was written, carried the implication that you could be raped if you were unworthy of a romance. So we talk a lot about rape culture, but we don't acknowledge that romance is the polite face of rape culture. Wow. Say more about that. Well, because romance makes it clear that you have an obligation to do your utmost to try to get to a woman who is worthy. And here are the worthy women. They should be white, right? Of course, at that time, they would have described them as Western European Christians, but those are the people today we consider white. 
They should be slender. They should have long hair, preferably blonde. They should be young. All of the qualities that we today would talk about as being the mainstream white ideal of beauty. Those were required in addition to having wealth and a high status, right? If you wanted a man to treat you with respect and dignity. But the further you are from having these qualities, the worse you can be treated with impunity. So this is how romance presents the polite face of rape culture. So how I, how I'm hearing it, and correct me if I didn't get it right, how I'm hearing it is that there is um, a setup of the, it's like a class culture that suddenly gets created. Mm -hmm. And because the higher level uh, of the people in the class uh, will look at the lower level of whatever they think or the culture established as lower, not that that's the true, but as the uh, as it, it created that culture, that because the uh, the upper class thinks that they could do whatever they want, that under the name under the name of romance, they'll come in and do use the person's, um, for example, use the woman's um, body, use the woman's emotion, use the woman's um services you in any format whether it's cooking or giving or caregiving or sexuality with with the concept of um not an equalism and not the concept of respect uh, or giving back and it's more just i'm going to use it and dump it yes. and that's how you're bringing it and putting the rape culture on top of that absolutely because uh, yeah, it authorizes the idea that if a woman is not in your view of your status or a higher status, if she's not worthy of effort, you just take what you want from her and then you discard her. And you see that more happening with the Black women in the United States. Do you see that also in Black women across the world or is it more the culture of the United States because of the slavery? I'm looking largely at U.S. culture, um, but I would hazard a guess that because anti-Blackness is global, which is the result of the transatlantic slave trade, you can probably find very similar effects in other countries, but they would need to have an independent empirical analyses. I could extend that um, because, you know, you talked about sex trafficking in your book. Um, and I could extend that to a lot of other places also, and not just Black women. Um, but I do get that the idea of using women who are considered a lesser uh, status, whether it's to their looks or whether it's to the family system they came, whether they came from poverty or a different version of that, that they would be used um, for sex trafficking, for uh, being abused, for being used in, in so many different layers. Um, please go ahead. Yes, and I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to use this concept that I invented of insufficient whiteness. It's not just about being a black woman, although <laughs> obviously being a black woman can lead you to have some of the worst romantic experiences. Um, and I'm not the only person who's chronicled that. I mean, there are so many different books, Dataclism by Christian Rudder, um, The Dating Divide by Kierington et al. So there are many different works out there that are looking at this. Uh, but I talk about insufficient whiteness because yes, Black women are experiencing some of the most dastardly outcomes, but it's not just Black women. It's any woman who is not thin enough, who is not polite enough, who's not docile enough, who's not willing to play the role of a white, wealthy, trad wife. What came to my mind, I'm going to tell you, and I hope you don't laugh at me, because my experience is also the other i look at it from I'm, 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 I'm not saying that i'm negating what you're saying what you're saying is absolutely accurate i'm um it's funny that i look at it also from another angle and i want to share it with you and see what you think of it i've watched as women have gotten very um strong in the western world white or black any color uh, brown, Asian, any any color you can talk about. That the stronger that the woman became, whether it was status, 
uh, financial independence and power, um, their voices was being shared in many different levels. Um, they owned you know, their own businesses and it was tougher and tougher for men to have that romance. Yeah. They couldn't handle a, um, a concept of a, of a woman being strong in so many layers. And then it, the dynamic changed of that, the, you know, the women automatically became their mother and they've turned more into kind of like a teenage mode. And I'm sorry for everyone who's listening and I'm generalizing. I apologize for generalizing, but at this point for the purpose of conversation, I'm not saying that hundred percent are that, but this is what I've, the trend that I've seen. And then because I also saw uh, uh, American black women as strong, you know, you could see so many of black women rising and being strong and heading not only generational of families, um, businesses, you know, uh, entertainment industry, sports industry, and hopefully the United States president. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something that's an improvement for my current situation? <laughs> yes. And and I always put that as the strength conversation, you know, that the, the men could not handle that type of strength. Um, and that's why I'm saying it, it was so uh, eye-opening when I was reading your book, because I came from this ideology and, and experience and looking at what you were saying and bringing all of those together um, in, in a bigger picture. So I don't know what your thought is about my experience. Well, the situation is that a lot of women want to have a romance. They love the idea of this, of a man showing up to be selfless because we so often meet men who are selfish. And to your point about the way in which there's a boyification going on, I think that that's pretty widely accepted. So, I mean, honestly, that's why you saw me roll my eyes. <laughs> like, I don't even think you need to apologize for that. I think women everywhere are seeing that men are turning into boys. And part of it is because of feminism. And maybe people are going to be a little bit upset about that, but that's just the reality. Romance had very clear gender roles. It said men are strong and brave, women are polite, docile. So as feminism was saying, no, you know, this is a misrepresentation of who we are. We contain multitudes and we also deserve the right to work in public. The more women made demands into incursions into what were for about 200 years um, after the enlightenment, so-called men's spaces, the more men started to first fight back against feminism usually in ways that women could not see, which is a way in which they hold on to power. Um, but then also they start to draw back romance. They're like, well, are we gonna be putting ourselves out for these feminist harpies and these scary career women? No, we want polite, quiet women. These are the ones who restore our classic sense of manhood. And so there is a lot of fraught and contentious, I think, interactions happening between men and women because men have always maintained the kind of woman that they want in the aggregate. It's not every single man, right? Whereas women increasingly are saying, we refuse to occupy those roles. They don't need to anymore. Many women don't, don't need to. And some women are going back into that, but then to feel um, a difference in their power but and i say this because well you know you're talking about pornography in your book and you're we're talking about you know sex trafficking and you know even sex workers um a lot of them experiencing the concept of you know they're um they're being abused in so many different way ways interestingly enough i have uh, worked with a lot of young women um again all races um all cultures who because of many of these uh, new types of um, websites um, have, uh, have created new sources of income for themselves. And they see that as power. They see that as I choose this, I choose whatever I want. I choose the man, I choose the price. I choose what I would even, you know, have sex or not. I choose if I want to have a companionship without any sexual experiences. And it it's a very different uh, conversation that is showing up again because of the accessibility 
to people across the world with all different um, feeling of freedom that they could. So there's also this angle that yes, in many, many cultures and still countries and that there is a way to um, abuse women, they do. And then yet on another side, women are using exactly the same modalities and exactly the same formats, but now saying I'm in power. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I think the critical difference is who is selling whom. If you are an individual and you are selling your own body, I agree that definitely our choices are constrained as women still, nevertheless. And so there will be more women, especially women from lower income circumstances, who might feel compelled to do that to earn a living, right? Nevertheless, they're choosing to sell themselves. Part of the problem with pornography is that it is men selling women, and it is selling women in a way that is deeply dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Women become a series of body parts and a series of orifices that men use at their will. In fact, there's even a type of pornography that is popular in the United States known as non-con, that is non-consensual. So in other words, young men can log on to see women being sexually assaulted and they can get some type of erotic gratification from that. That is very different from a woman who's choosing on her OnlyFans page to take her clothes off. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, so part of what you're talking about in this book is that overall across the world, um, we're kind of seeing the collapse of traditional romantic love, courtship and marital type. Yes. And one of the things that I also want to bring up is that we think about this as being traditional, but in reality, as I've mentioned, Romance was disconnected from commitment and marriage, and it was disconnected for 600 years. So for the first 600 years in which romance existed, it was a fantasy, largely you know, originated by a woman, but then also later written by so many men as a way of claiming this identity for themselves. Yes, we are knights, we are valorous and brave, and we save ladies, we protect them. There was a strong Christian component to it as well. But as Christianity in the West is starting to lose its hold, and as feminism is making incursions into spaces where men frequently don't want women, but women have a right to be, we can see that romance itself is going away. And also, even though we think of romantic relationships as being traditional, in reality, the connection between romance and marriage only began in the 18th century. So we're seeing the tail end of a dramatic experience, uh, experiment because prior to romance being connected to marriage, marriages were arranged largely by family members. That's the more traditional route. Yes. I mean, unless the Christian nation starts again. Um, so, hard to see that happening in this place right now. But, oh, uh, God. Yeah. Um, so what you say in your book is romantic love is not the height of our expression of love. It is in fact the only form of love that has as a history. And like love of self, family, community, or even natural forms of sexual love, romantic love is simply a Eurocentric story and it has been foisted on us. Uh, and at times really ruined our life um, because of all the expectation and the fantasy that we actually held on it. And then at the end you say, we are love, we are all love. And, but many of us are consumed with petty narcissistic romantic dramas that are uh, that our non-white forebears could not have seen a fathom. So um, when you look at, um, if you took away the romance from this whole uh, scenario, what do you see uh, fostering beyond it? If we are prepared to acknowledge that we're living through a gender and sexual revolution in which old ideas about who women are and who men are and the fact that there are only two genders are absolutely going away, not to mention the explosion of new sexual identities and expressions. If we will fully embrace that, we don't need romance because love stories precede romance, but they were colonized by romance. Romance said, okay, we're going to take love stories that have always existed in a variety of different cultures across the globe, and we're going to make them very specific 
right? They're very much about the type of man that will save a woman who men believe are worthy of, save, of saving. Instead of all of that, we can show our affection to one another genuinely without the expectation that a man has money, <laughs> that a woman looks a particular way, that a man has a particular kind of job, that a woman is a particular status. I have a relative who is a man who is on the dating apps, which are trash. Um, and I think people increasingly acknowledge that. But one of the things that he was blown away by is that he met a woman. And, you know, on their very first date, this woman asked him what kind of car he drives. Now, if you're a man and you have a woman, you're supposed to be trying to see if you want to spend significant time with this person. If they're investigating your assets at your very first meeting, you're probably going to be a little less interested at the end. We can let go of all of these expectations that people have money or look a particular way and we can love more freely. A lot of times I get the uh, cliche sentences and the generalized sentences that, you know, from, from men I hear uh, who come to my um, office is like, you know, and they're dissatisfied from what they're finding on uh, the apps and the dating apps. And it's like, all women want is just money. And then women come and say, all men want is just to get into my pants. And that's what they want. <laughs> my answer is usually that's not all they want, but if that's all you're offering, then that's what they take. But, you know, all of us want everything in, from that comes into a relationship. Um, and, you know, it, it's up it's up to you in what you're trying to offer. But you, the concept of uh, love and romance and you know I think we've today we've talked a lot in the context of heterosexuality and we see that even uh, that spectrum is opening up so even that format is changing and a lot of people are you know experimenting in different format with uh, whether they're experimenting or they're coming into space or they're finding themselves and they're not no longer experimenting they're finding themselves of not wanting to go into uh, you know, heterosexual um, life, or some people still choose, even though they're not heterosexual, choose to live heterosexual lives because of their society. So we also have a lot of different kind of spectrums from one, you know, from one extreme to another. Um, so definitely the concepts are opening and they're not very strict and put in boxes anymore. And it, it's the ability to know who we are and what's right for us and then coming back and looking. And I think part of, you know, as a, as a, as a psychotherapist, I look at individuality as a sociologist, you look at culture and, and the bigger picture. So we're coming from two different angles to it. Everybody, you've got to read this book, The End of Love, Racism, Sexism, and the Death of Romance by Dr. Sabrina Strings. Dr. Strings, anything we haven't shared um, through our conversation that you really want people to know? I want people to know that we all have the innate capacity to love. Love is about generosity. And when we try to make romance the way in which we love, then love is about selfishness. Oh, what can I get from someone else? Wait, can they give me money? Can they give me a child or you know, maybe a homemaker? If we want to love capaciously, in, in a way that everyone has access to, then we shouldn't be so attached to the idea that this sexual script should be at the center of our world. Beautifully said. And where could people find you? You can find me on um, Instagram, Yogini Black. That's my handle. On Twitter, at S-A Strings. And you can also check my website, sabrinastrings.com. Beautiful. It was great to talk, to talk to you. Thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you so much for having me. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, bye-bye. Are you a psychotherapist looking to enhance your practice? The Awareness Integration Therapy developed by Dr. Fujian Zeng is a comprehensive guide to the principle and techniques of this powerful therapeutic approach. Join the growing community who have elevated their practice and expanded their skills by embracing awareness integration therapy and witnessing its life-changing impact. Order your copy on Amazon now.